Welcome to Out of the Question, a podcast that looks behind some common questions and uncovers the question behind the question while providing real solutions for biblical world and life view. Your co-hosts are Pastor Steve Macias and Andrea Schwartz, a teacher and mentor. Thanks for joining us for another edition of the Out of the Question podcast. And today's question probably will be something that sounds familiar to you if you've been hanging out um, anywhere on planet Earth for the last eight months or so. And the question I'm going to ask is, should we follow the science? Now, that's an expression that we hear from all sides in terms of this coronavirus and what we should or shouldn't be doing about it. So, Steve, is that even a valid question? Should we follow the science? Doesn't it beg a bunch of other questions? Well, I think it certainly does. And the listener right now can see that there's an inherent philosophical problem with the idea of following the science if you watch any bit of news at all. To follow the science is a very dangerous thing to do in 2020 because you'll see on MSNBC one scientist who says X, Y, and Z, and then you'll see on Fox News another scientist who says X, Y, and Z, and oftentimes they're saying exactly the opposite things. You'll have one study that comes out from this university directly conflicting with the accepted and documented (laughs) survey or, or experiment or study from a previous university. So... Behind the idea of trust the science, of following the science, of believing in, quote, science, is this idea that particular data points or particular material information is available and that we will, by our rational or empirical mind, be able to discern and decipher what that science is and how to apply it to us today, which, as we see causes a lot of problems, not just in the laboratory, but politically, sociologically, even down to the family and to the school. So the implication of following the science is that everybody agrees on what that science is. And so now we're back in the realm of presuppositions and as something that Rush Dooney talked about, taking from Van Til, this idea of brute factuality, as if there's such a thing as an uninterpreted fact. Would you go into that a little bit? Because some of our listeners may not be familiar with the concept of brute factuality. Right, so Van Til kind of debunks this idea that we are neutral creatures who are rationally deciphering different ideas. Now, as Christians, we're easy, we can easily identify that there is no such thing as, as brute factuality. When we read our scripture, we bring into our reading of scripture our own history, our own commentaries, our own religious traditions. Uh, But we also do that with everything else. One of the great and dangerous myths of rational period of study is the idea that man was born with a blank slate. We can see this in Lockean and Rousseau's philosophy of the idea that man was born tabula rasa. So the Latin expression meaning that you're born and there is no information in your brain. And therefore, the only way you can decipher the facts is by measuring them, smelling them, touching them, and drawing either conclusions based on your sensory input or inferences based on expecting chocolate to smell like chocolate tomorrow. The problem with that type of empirical thinking, this idea of brute factuality, is it doesn't account for the universal nature of information, that things must be interpreted through a lens, that there is a a way of translating what we see, of what we do, what we hear into real information. Now, John Lennox has a great way of of explaining this, and he calls it uh, something of his ant's baking experiment. And so he says, imagine your ant, and you can put any ant in here. I'm going to use my Aunt Marjorie. And Aunt Marjorie bakes a beautiful, wonderful, delicious cake. And Lennox says that if she takes this cake to the Nobel Laureate Committee, and they are tasked with examining scientifically the cake. Well, on the Nobel Laureate Committee, there's a physicist, a chemist, a biologist, and they can put all the pieces of that cake through 
a microscope. They can take the pieces out and test it. They can find out everything that the cake is made out of. They can decide if it's got high enough caloric content, if it has pure ingredients. They can go through all of the things to decipher what the cake is. And that's really the brute factuality of the cake. But could they answer a very simple question? And that is, why did your aunt make the cake? And so no matter how much they look at it, no matter how much they examine it, no matter how many times they go through the ingredients list, that question is still a mystery that needs something beyond empiricism, needs something beyond brute factuality. Now, when we look at our lives and how we understand the relationship of science to our various spheres of influence, why is it that this particular fact, uh, how a virus works, how the spread of germs is, how we became who we are, we can look at what we see, but we're not arguing just one fact versus another. We're arguing about causation and why and origins. And just like the Nobel Committee, as bright as they are, they cannot answer even the simplest questions without going to the reasons for why things are. And that goes back to the idea that science will have a bias. I think it was R.J. Rush Dooney who said, science in the 20th century, maybe slightly before that, replaced theology as the main concern and orientation for people. And so when the scientific method is used to determine that evolution is true and creation is wrong, how many people should then trust any scientist whose presuppositions are so faulty as to think there was a big bang and that human beings evolved from single-celled creatures. So if we don't examine the train of thought and the presuppositions, no matter how smart that Nobel laureate commission is, they're not going to come up with a correct adjudication if they don't acknowledge that the flower came from someplace, the eggs came from someplace, your Aunt Marjorie came from someplace. And, and so I think that we have, in many cases, blindly given credit to something that doesn't deserve that kind of credit. Right. And I think here, our friend C.S. Lewis is very helpful because science, in its pure sense, the applied reasoning or rationality of the human mind to the biological world is completely within the scope of presuppositional apologetics. It's within the scope of reform theology. It's the product of a Western Christian worldview. So there's nothing wrong with the idea of science. When Dr. Van Til talks about science and using natural revelation, he's saying that those things really only work because we're made in the image of God and have this analogical reasoning by which we can decipher the world. It's not in contradiction to faith to talk about science, but it's recognizing that science is subservient to the Almighty God, or science is a tool with limited capacities. Now, the great issue with the 20th century, uh, where C.S. Lewis is writing, was the idea of scientism. It was the movement or the transformation of science as being a discipline within a theory of knowledge, science as a discipline within empiricism, or science as a discipline within the idea of human rationality, to science as a religion. There is a, a movement you know, from Darwin onwards to remove science as the application of rational thought to the source of rational thought or the source of information, uh, which is an impossibility. Scientism, as C.S. Lewis calls it, places a great deal of faith in the hands of men who are just tinkering at the workbench. And for this reason, Lewis talks about scientism as the twin, not of Christian science or Christian ideas or applications of knowledge, but rather modern scientism as it's applied in the chemistry lab, trying to debunk the creation idea or applied to politics. Uh, this is the twin of mythology, or as C.S. Lewis put it, scientism is the twin of magic in the modern 20th century world. The idea that man could control his environment and manipulate his environment through faith in some 
outside of us process was the origin of scientism. And it was fully embraced as a religious message. Men like H.G. Wells, who wrote War of the Worlds, were also writing on the idea of science in a very romantic and a triumphalistic way. The idea that evolution itself was not just an explanation of how we went from single cell to multi-cell, from chimpanzee through Neanderthal. It wasn't so much that explanation of empirical facts. For men like H.G. Wells and the scientists who applied it to philosophy in the 20th century, this was the romantic triumph of mankind from the origins of anthropological man developing, surviving, triumphing, growing, evolving, eventually into what H.G. Wells describes as the demigod man, the who is like God man, using science as a way of their progress, growth, and eventually dominion. So very much so in the scientistic worldview is this idea of religious identity, faith in a process that made us into something new. And that's very different than saying this atom and this atom make this particular atomic structure. Which goes to the idea that everything has a religious component. In other words, what modern scientists like to say is they're going to keep religion out of science and get rid of any biases, when in actual fact, modern scientism, as you said, Lewis referred to it, is a religious belief. Why? Because a lot of the premises are not based on anything that can be tested. It's based on faith. It reminds me of that funny story when Dr. Rushduni was serving as an expert witness in the Leaper case, when the opposing attorney was trying to discredit him and tried to get him to say that he didn't believe in evolution. And so what do you have to say for that? As the story goes, Rush's response was, I don't have that much faith to believe in evolution. But the point is that this religious fervor of pushing science and deciding that you're going to push Christianity out of the way really points to the fact that it's a competing religion today. It is not something that's independent and objective and doesn't bring a whole slew of baggage with it. The baggage is is very important here too, because the main place where science is discussed happens to be a political sphere, right? The, The connection in the 21st century has been politics and science have been fused. And this movement really began as a reaction to politics and religion being fused. But we've changed one poison for another, as they might say. So we see that politics determines the funding for our universities, and the universities have, for the most part, embraced a naturalistic or evolutionary view of the world. And they've perpetuated that view that this is what true science is. And political figures have found that the expertise or the illusion of authority that science gives them is worth the funding. And so what I mean by that is something very simple. When the press secretary for the president of the United States gets up in front of the newspaper, she could say, the Lord says, fear not, go for, open your supermarkets. But that's not going to be respected by the consensus of the newspapers and universities. And so what does she do? She says, well, the the science is on our side. If you look at this microbe or that, there's a sense in which her authority as somebody speaking on behalf of a political figure now comes from this other religion, this other source of place, this other source of expertise. And our culture has said that that is science. And so not just our generation with this particular crisis, but the mythology of scientism has been used as a source of authority for the last 150 years. In fact, the original description and the power under which Marxism or socialist philosophies entered into the political sphere was under the auspices of scientism. Right? It's not long ago that we talked about eugenics as a completely independent and biological science in the university. There were heads of eugenics research in all of our publicly funded major universities not a century ago. And the idea behind them was socialistic scientism. It's what they called their Marxist philosophy. Which is a very interesting point when you think about it, because... 
the buzzword today and has been probably for the last 50 years is this idea of racism. And racism is a relatively new concept in terms of the history of man. People used to divide themselves or discriminate based on their religious perspectives, not on their physical distinctives or the color of their skin. And yet it's a direct result of Darwin's explanation of how man came to be as opposed to the book of Genesis explanation of how man came to be that has us looking not as all people descend from Adam and then after Adam descend from Noah. It's that there might have been different evolutionary processes, which would mean some characteristics came from one set of lesser creatures over another. And so today, the argument of those who would like to destroy Western civilization, which could be parenthetically referred to as Christian civilization, wants to reduce it down to you're wrong because of the color of your skin. This is not something that derived from a Christian world and life view. It's something that has derived from an evolutionary Darwinian point of view. But the interesting part is this idea that one person is better than another is attributed to the patriarchy or to Christian civilization that has to be torn down. So we're seeing the outworkings of a religious perspective that really and truly embodies the idea of the sin of Genesis 3-5 to be as God and to determine for oneself what's right and wrong. Well, for the Christian, God determines what's right and what's wrong. Right. And for the Christian, God determines what's valuable or what's important. And so from a, a scientific or a, a scientistic rational viewpoint, where is the value of human life? Why would any human be valuable intrinsically? Or why do they have any natural identity? Is it because they're a more evolved species? Is it because they have some sense of cognitive ability? At that point, the particular data points of scientific theory don't add anything to that conversation. In fact, it's the exact opposite in when we tinker with God's why. When we take away the basic biblical information that says every man and every woman are made in the image of God, they're made perfect, they're made whole, and they're to be defended because of that relationship of being you know, in the imago Dei. But it is, just as you point out, when that standard, when that why is questioned, well, who cares if God says man is valuable? That is the foothold where Darwinism or naturalism are able to put inside the equation their arbitrary database scientific facts that seem to question God's standards. And so it was a scientific revolution that said that the people from Africa were less than those who were light-skinned. It was a scientific fact that said that they deserved to be slaves because they were inferior stock. It was a scientific fact that said that they should be in different cities and different schools and different places. These were all based on their experts at the time. And this is really a great danger in our culture of our dependence and emphasis on experts and these arbitrary standards of scientific idea. Now, as Reformation Christians, we can easily identify when people begin to act like popes, right? We can say, who do you think you are to speak ex cathedra infallibly, right? We, we separated from the Roman Catholic Church under the understanding that no man is an expert in himself, that all of us are under the authority of the scripture. But how many of us confess that on Sundays, but then live the rest of our lives in our jobs, in our positions, in our universities, in how we choose our kids to be educated, thinking as though science can be unchained from the same type of authority. That somehow when the scientists at Genentech Labs come up with an explanation, that somehow they could speak ex cathedra, they could speak with authority, and that however they inform our pol politicians that that's beyond our rebuke and questioning because they're the authorities. 
Yet the very heart of Reformation philosophy is that all facts, all ideas, all data, whether it's in science or in the Bible, are subservient to Jesus Christ and to his word because all things were made by him and through him all things come together and have their meaning, have their being. But he is the source of all wisdom, intelligence, information, that because of that, science must be secondary to the lordship and reign of Jesus Christ. Which kind of goes back to the idea that some Christians will tell you the Bible's fine for telling us how to live, but it's not a science textbook. Jesus didn't claim to be a biologist or a chemist. And they somehow or other betray the fact that in that statement, they're saying the Bible can't be authoritative in terms of how we approach life, how we approach problems. And you and I were having a discussion a while back that you said you to pose the question, who was the greatest scientist? Who was the greatest mathematician ever? Who was the greatest historian? Why don't you share what your answer was? Well, I think that, that most of us could go to somebody like Einstein, or we might go to a modern scientist, maybe somebody like Elon, Elon Musk, or go those type of things. Uh, but I've asked that question from many different people. And very rarely, even here in, in the school, are we taught to think of Jesus as the preeminent scientist, right? When have you last seen an icon with Jesus wearing lab goggles and uh, putting together an experiment in a Petri dish or looking through a microscope? Would you see that and be aghast at the idea that Jesus understands chromosomes better than the National Health Institute? Would you be aghast to think about the idea that Jesus, who lived in first century Judea, had a better grasp of molecular genetics? He knew the human sequencing of the genome better than Watton and Crick. These guys who are peeking into the reality of our current world don't understand what they see through the microscope any better. In fact, they understand it much, much less than our Lord who lived 2,000 years ago. But that's really the foundational thought that's allowed Christians to lead in sciences. Uh, one of the first Christian scientists that I ever studied was before I was a Christian, and I was almost uh, insulted to learn that he was a monk, and that was Gregor Mendel. So some of you have, have used Mendel's uh, thinking and thought for trying to figure out your kid's eye colors or trying to figure out hair color. You've seen the Mendel squares where you can guess what kind of hair color your kid will get based on their genetic makeup from mom and dad. Well, what is often forgotten about Gregor Mendel is that he was not particularly brilliant in his own mind. He wasn't from a good family, but rather this farmer's son, Gregor Mendel, thought, if I join a monastery, then perhaps I can get an education, which is how everybody thought up until the last hundred years, that the church was the source of or the theology was the queen of all of our innovation and progress towards scientific truth. So the father of modern genetics, by which we're discussing a lot today with our virus information, was Gregor Mendel, who was very similar to a Reformation figure named Martin Luther, and that they both joined Augustinian monasteries. And that is, I think, important too, because to be an Augustinian is to recognize the depravity of the human mind, the recognition that because of the effect of sin on our entire person, that we're looking at the world through tainted information. The idea that, that Augustine saw that original sin affected how we interpreted facts allowed Mendel to look at the world as an image bearer, but also recognize that how he saw it wasn't the whole picture, that there was something beyond what his senses could see, and that if he aligned those two things, the, what he could see with the reasons and the faith picture that his faith gave him, that there was a projection, that there's more to this world. There's something to be figured out because God made things rationally and orderly. And so the father of modern genetics, did such inside the context of the Christian faith, not in conflict with it, but precisely because and as a result of his Christian theology. So we're back to the whole realm of education. Would a society be able to 
except swallow the latest edict from the talking head on the television if that same society knew their history, if they understood what you just talked about in terms of Luther and Mendel. Then they would question, what's the presupposition of the person who's telling me this particular thing? And the sad part about it is it, we could all look at that we're all victims of this conspiracy, of this cohabitation of politics of the university that produces disciples who hate God, hate his commandments, and gear themselves towards socialism. But it's a laziness. It says, why would these people lie to me? I should just accept it. And I think that that's a, a real deficit within Christianity, that we haven't taken God's command to seek first the kingdom of God and his justice or righteousness, and we've turned it over to a bunch of people who are going to tell us how to think, tell us how to live, but suddenly their decisions are bringing up a lot of catastrophic events, whether it's fires in California or lockdowns in different parts of the country, and draconian measures against people who would potentially disagree, this is sort of the result of not trusting Jesus as the premier scientist, historian, philosopher, and having this compartmentalized view that said, well, Sunday worship is enough, but then we'll have to go and, and listen to what the experts say elsewhere. That's right. Part of that compartmentalization that you're talking about uh, is going back to what Ventil described of this belief in neutrality. Because I think the greatest danger, even as, as we talk about competing views of science or competing views of various philosophies or theories, that there are Christians who have this altruistic view of modern science, that everybody must have the, the same goal, that we're all moving in the same direction, and that science is basically good. And what's really important as Reformation Christians is to recognize that every motivation outside of serving Christ is not basically good. There is no neutrality. There is no common ground between those who are serving themselves and those who are serving Christ. And so rather than viewing the modern scientific university or the modern scientific organization as altruistic. They just want to help people. They just want to see a vaccine to see people saved. We should naturally be skeptical of it because of its origins. Now, in the mythology of science, Dr. Rushdoony talks about that Darwin's motivation was not this pure sense of, I'm confused by why these birds look different. I'm confused by why there's special differences. That wasn't the issue. Darwin's real issue and the real problem that he was solving and the real reason why everybody ate up Darwinism without the brute factuality was that there was a religious hunger in the 20th and, or 19th and 20th century to find a way out of the constraints of Christian moral theology. The greatest data point in favor of Darwinist philosophy, the greatest data point even today for evolutionary philosophy has nothing to do with anything you see under a microscope. The greatest impetus in support of evolution is that if I believe it, I don't have to pay attention to the Ten Commandments. If I believe that man was made from swirling specks of dust and space and cosmic radiation, then nobody can tell me how to live my life. If I believe that we are just descending from the greatest organisms up until who we are by random chance and chaos, then there is no cosmic duty or responsibility on my life. And so this is the brute factuality problem because Christians will try to get down into the weeds and say, well, we'll look at these species. We're missing a, a missing link. And they're frustrated that they cannot convince the evolutionists to reject their philosophy, even though they can show them on the same laboratory, in the same science textbooks, why their religion of evolution, their religion of naturalism is inconsistent. That's not good enough because it's not the real reason they believe it. The real reason they believe it is what you mentioned there in Genesis 3, 
They want to escape the obligations to their creator that St. Paul says they know exists and they reject in their disobedience and rebellion. Right. Suppressing the truth in unrighteousness is how Romans 1 describes it. And yet we see the progression. As soon as that takes hold of a society, then you have the immoral, sexual proclivities of people where everything now sexual is okay. And then we go to a depraved mind. And I don't know about you, but when you look at some of the people who are videoed destroying cities, it's the epitome of a depraved mind. There's no way else to explain that because coming out of their mouth are just utter profanities and vulgarities as a way in which to intimidate. And too many people don't really have an answer or even have a way to think it through because they've bought into the idea that they have to trust the scientists. And, you know, we started off with, should we follow the science? Well, that's become a new phrase this year because of the whole corona thing, as has sheltering in place and social distancing. Well, go back a couple of decades to the late 50s. This would be a post-World War II society where people were tired of war and they wanted to see that there was this rising expectation we could conquer anything. And an expression came about when you didn't understand something. Well, you know what? I'm not a rocket scientist. And that would somewhat tell you that you'd have to sort of succumb to or go along with whatever the scientists said, because they were way smarter than you are. And I still hear that expression today when they're trying to, somebody's trying to tell somebody it's really not that hard to understand. You know, this isn't rocket science. Well, inadvertently, when we go along with that train of thought, we're elevating rocket science and things that can't be easily explained to the average guy. Well, figure how different biblical truth is. Biblical truth is so profound and yet simple enough that children can understand it. That's right. Well, and really this is why what we believe and how we understand information and history is so important. One of the talking points that comes with this idea of the science, trust the science, follow the scientists, believe the science, the science will save us, is really this idea of scientific progress. But what is really missing is that any idea of human development, of any idea of progress towards a better world is within the realm of Christianity only. Uh, Dr. Rushduni in the mythology of science goes through how St. Augustine way back in you know, the fourth century broke away from the Hellenistic idea of modal non-diversity, meaning that the Greek system said that this is how things are. We can look at what things are, but we can never expect them to change because if everything's random and chaos, then things can never really improve. It was Augustine's assertion that because there is an eternal decree that God has a big, has created the world with a beginning and has laid out a rational world, that any hope of progress in humankind would be done according to Christian scientific theory. Now, man's rebellion, therefore, against God as the author or the creator is not just a rejection of some religious idea, but rather his rebellion is against the idea of progress and science. And so what we should expect as more and more people reject Christian ideas of history, of Christian ideas of progress, Christian ideas of absolute truths is the de-evolution and destruction of science, which I think the last 50 years have seen. The, the great atrocities done as scientists figured out and tinkered with nuclear weapons uh, that's the de-evolution of science. We look at the, the great widespread death of pre-born children at the hands of scientific information. That is the destruction of progress. And yet we're told to trust these same people that progress will be in their favor when the reality is progress is only possible if we begin with Jesus Christ as our starting point in his consistent and rational worldview. Exactly. And we can expect, if we don't have people repenting of this sin, to have greater atrocities. Now, 
because of the whole COVID thing, we hear lots of discussion on we need a vaccine. Well, when people don't understand that these same scientists who have not consulted God's word as to what's right and what's wrong have taken the products of aborted children and experimented with it, looking for quote unquote cures of diseases, how foolish they are to think that they're going to best God. Psalm 2 is often looked at in terms of political, but we could also say it in terms of biological science. In other words, God laughs. They think they're going to create something that rivals God, just like the builders of the Tower of Babel thought the same thing. But until man bends the knee one way or another, either in submission or because it becomes apparent that they are headed for hell, and they still will bow the knee, that we're not going to see progress the way modern scientism promises it. We're going to see more disease. We're going to see more problems because when you don't do it God's way, you bring about curses on yourself. Right. And I don't believe that we're just merely postulating or guessing the future. I think that modern scientism has been a long Long enough, been around long enough that we can see this trend. We don't need to look at speculation when we talk about the effect of scientism on culture. The scientific Darwinism or the scientific socialism that led to the USSR had a similar trajectory as we are. And Dr. Rushdoni points out that this trajectory is much like the prodigal son. The prodigal son leaves home with his inheritance. Now, in philosophy, we have this thing called borrowed capital, the idea that people don't start where they are with a blank slate, but rather they have the accumulated knowledge and information of all of those who studied before them. So scientists in the 18th century had the 2,000 years of Christian philosophy in the back of their minds, of Christian understandings of reality when they went about applying the empirical method. But just like the prodigal son who went out and lived lavishly, who for the initial part of it was probably living a good life. He had his entire inheritance to spend with wine, woman, and song. But eventually that borrowed capital runs out. Eventually there comes a point in which you return back to the presuppositions that you started with, the prodigal son rejects the wisdom of his father, and his end result is eating with pigs and slop. Now, in the USSR, initially, with the borrowed capital of Western culture, (laughs) the socialist revolution had success. They had food, they had clothing, they had progress, they built roads and buildings and had status as a national or an international superpower. But very quickly, the presuppositions of their science, of their politics, of their philosophy came home to roost, and there was mass starvation. There were famine throughout the land as their philosophy, science, and theology came back to them. They became the prodigal son inside the pig pen eating the pig slop. I think that's what's happening today. Perhaps we're at the tail end of the wine, woman, and song part of the prodigal son in America and our scientism. But we should expect that the further we get away from our father's wisdom, that eventually our inheritance will run out. Eventually, we're going to get to the points of extreme where human value and dignity are completely forgotten because those are detached religious ideals. And in a world where there is no eternal truths, no absolute reality, we should expect that the future of the socialist republics will become our future. They'll be accompanied by human suffering, famine, death, and disease, not by any sense of progress. And this, again, is why a knowledge of history and what you just described is more modern history than going back to the fifth century. What's one of the things that's the hallmark? of oppressive, tyrannical countries in our day. The absence of liberty for those to express their religious beliefs and practice. And so you wouldn't be hard pressed 
10 years ago to ask people if they would donate money so that there could be Bibles sent to Eastern Europe or to Behind the Iron Curtain, as it was referred to, or China or other parts. Yet today in the U.S., we have this mandate that says churches cannot meet. And it's basically justified because of what? The science. The science says it's not safe. And how many churches went along with that? Because when it comes right down to it, their presuppositions are probably much more tied to scientism than it is to biblical orthodox theology. And so it's time for people to say, we must follow the Lord, we must follow the word rather than follow the science, because the implications of no church, however flawed the church may be today, but no church is exactly what tyrannies flourish with when there is no voice saying, thus saith the Lord. Tyranny is a a complicated word, too. I, I think what we really try to escape is what the Bible says about authority and tyranny. And we really want to believe that people are not trying to overpower us or control us. We really don't want to believe that there's some conspiracy or or things like that. But the reality is there are only two options. Serve the king of the universe, the creator of all things, or place yourself in his position. And we've talked a lot about biological science, but in our political discussion today, science has attempted to play God, not just with disease and vaccines, not just with controlling people politically, but think about what's discussed at the UN. Think about what's discussed on CNN as far as international science, this idea of of climate change or global warming. Now, we are told in the scriptures that our Lord controls the weather that hurricanes and earthquakes are all the consequence of our Lord's divine orchestration, that he made it to be, he set it in place, and he actively controls our world. And yet, there's almost a scoff when when somebody like Pat Robertson says, a hurricane is a judgment, or a tornado is a judgment. Yet, at the same time, people like Al Gore, or this young girl from Sweden, who uh, wants to deride us for not taking good care of our planet, seem to possess in their mind the same type of authority, that they could control the weather through their actions, that science would give them the power and authority or the tyranny over all of the natural process of the world. We can end the effect of sin in disease. We can end the effect of sin in pollution. We could even control when the rain comes down and when the the water rises and when the ice melts. There is this total scientistic arrogance in the evolutionary worldview that puts themselves as though they are God. And what governs or basically substantiates their authority and power is that they prey on people's fears. Fears that we have 12 years left to live. Fears that millions of people will die from a virus. Fears that we'll be consumed with killer bees or whatever the latest scare tactic will be. Yet for the Christian, we're commanded to fear God and that when we fear God honestly and demonstrate our fear of God and his power by keeping his commandments, then we get this interesting byproduct called wisdom. There is no wisdom derived from the fear of man. There is no wisdom derived from the fear of experts. But when you fear God, when you seek the kingdom, you become wise, and then suddenly your eyes are open to a lot of things that you would not have noticed before. So when Jesus tells his disciples that the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lame will walk, he certainly was talking literally, but I think he was talking beyond that. Think of you and me as we talk about prior to our conversion. It's not a stretch to say we were blind, deaf, and lame. And as a result of absorbing the scripture, applying the scripture, and seeking God's truth, then any wisdom that we come about or we're able to share with others is a direct result of those other two things. That's right. Well, and part of this fear 
is inside of naturalism or an evolutionary worldview is that there is an expectation that nature is by itself chaotic. It's unpredictable. It's unexpected. There's no order to it. The very word random is used to describe how evolution came to be, right? Random amino acids, random cells, random speciation. This idea of chaos is intrinsic to their philosophy. And it's based on this idea that there is nothing governing the world that we live in which is a frightful thing. It's, will there be a vaccine? I don't know. It's, it's chaos. It's random. Will there be a future? Well, it seems as though there is no order in things. So maybe a hurricane or a comet or aliens, whatever random thing is next going to come in and take us away. Whereas the creationist or the Christian worldview says, the eternal decree says there's a beginning. He set the beginning from the end. He organized the world after his own rational mind. And there is a great confidence that we have that we can conquer diseases, we can overcome difficulties and even disabilities. And as Christ himself says, we will do greater miracles than he himself did because of this idea of Christian progress. Rather than viewing science as an enemy of the faith, or rather than seeing science as superior to faith, by placing scientific inquiry, the method and all that it belongs to back under the queen of the sciences, theology, we're able to build and continue to build a Christendom that respects human dignity, that continues to see flourishing and does not fall prey to the fears and power hungry leaders of socialist scientism. Right. Well, our time's about up, but I want to point out that we've referenced a couple of times Dr. Rushduni's book, The Mythology of Science. Now, interestingly enough, this book was written in 1967. It was reprinted in 1995, and then the most recent printing was 19 years ago in 2001. And these, this book is still available from Cal Seed and Ross House Books. The interesting part is, Mark Rushduni, the author's son, pointed out in 2001 that some people might think it odd that there's a book on science and it's that we were sharing with people was quote unquote dated. But if you haven't read this book, I highly recommend it because you will see being played out today in the things that no doubt trouble you or are troublesome, the roots in what Dr. Rush Duty was mentioning. And I would also recommend if since medicine and follow the science in medicine is currently also being touted, his other book called Faith and Wellness, again, available from Calcedon, talks about the magic that Steve mentioned in terms of what C.S. Lewis had to say and how Christians, if we want to advance, need to understand whether or not our ideas are based on the foundation of Jesus as the rock. That's right. Well, and two pieces. We talked a lot about brute factuality and understanding really a theory of knowledge or epistemology. Uh, a great book that Calcedon publishes uh, is By What Standard by Dr. Rush Juni, uh, which was meant to really explain Van Til's philosophy and his book psychology of religion uh, gets into how we understand science to be a religious movement uh, not directly but how there is a psychology of what we believe and how it informs how we act those are all philosophical books but if you wanted to just read a light book by c.s lewis on how he understood science going there's a third part of the space trilogy which stands on its own that hideous strength one of my favorite books just talks about the idea of religious tinkering in science and the atrocities it can bring. That idea of strength is a great read for anybody. Very good. Well, thanks listeners for joining us. If you wish to communicate, you can reach us by email at out of the question podcast at gmail.com. And we'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening to out of the question. For more information on this and other topics, please visit calcedon.edu.